If I was gonna describe lead poisoning of children in one word, I would say horrific. Poison, that's what it is, it's poison. Lead poisoning is the perfect predator. It's somebody we don't like very much. It's a monster. Tragic. It hides under your bed, scares the living crap out of you because you don't believe it's there. And then it rears its ugly head and it gives you nightmares. We have a legacy to deal with. And the legacy is that we used lead in our products for a long period of time during one of the largest expansions of housing stock in America in general, post-World War II. It's still there. Any home built before 1978 should be treated as though there is potential for exposure to lead-based paint or other lead hazard. Lead-based elevations, whether it's through soil, whether it's through spices and cosmetics or old deteriorated paint, can be an issue to anybody. I find that frustrating. Uh, I find it frustrating on the level of both being a physician, being a parent, and a community member. Uh, we should be doing better, and I think as we look across the country, this is not just related to my community, this is related to many, many, many communities. We need to have an approach that will eliminate this issue. I first learned that I was lead poisoning, I think, when I was in elementary school when I actually finally understood what it meant to have had lead poisoning and how it affected my learning and how I was slower in the learning aspect than the other students. I didn't know how to feel about it. And I started to fail my math class and then it was just really hard. And I wanted to drop out in fifth grade. Mom said no, I was not happy about that. <laughs> She was done, she didn't want to go anymore. She hated school on top of being bullied but not being able to focus and feeling different. When I was in elementary school, it was a lot harder for me to learn and I felt like the other kids were smarter than me and better than me and everything. But it, I was just slower at learning. Like In fifth grade, I was in the special education reading class and mom would work at, with me at home on reading and then by the end of the fifth grade, I was in the highest reading class. But I did feel like I wasn't fast enough in elementary school. My nonverbal communication to Kiana was non-existent. You know, I could be in public and you give that mom look and her brother would get it and her sister being a baby would get it and she would just be like, what? Lead is very sweet tasting. So when kids get a taste of it, that's why they'll continue to do it. We moved into a new place a year ago, September. It was an old house built in 1869. I noticed that there were a lot of peeling paint. The house is old, so naturally that paint was going to be lead. She peeled it off the door, she ate some, and she gave it to her brother. And the way we found out is that we were in the house two weeks. Gabriel, our boy, had a routine blood draw. The doc called me and he said that your kids' levels are higher than anyone my office has seen. My name is Aaron. Uh, my son's name is Christopher, and he's nine. Wonderful, happy child. And uh, we've known that he was autistic since before he was two. We were questioning other things that were going on with him, if there was a dual diagnosis, or if there were other issues. And we lived in a home that was built in 1853. It was brownstone on, you know, very populated street. There was plenty of other homes like it. Once we found out that there was lead in the home, we went and got him tested. He came out with very high lead levels, and that part of the story began. We did the math and how long it could have been in there, and everything kind of started making sense. The behaviors that came with unableness to communicate, he was getting very frustrated because he wanted to come out with something. But then with the research that I've done, I do believe that that was a big reason why Christopher is not going to be able to advance. Griffin was about five and Mason was about three when we found out. We got a call from the health department telling me that Griffin um, came in with a lead level of 86 um, and Mason um, came in with a lead level of 27. So I had no idea how serious the numbers were. I was extremely angry. I was angry that the world, that I was angry at the, you know, the, the owner of the home, I was angry at everything, and I needed answers. 
He wasn't speaking. He wasn't understanding simple concepts. He was screaming a lot. He couldn't be around a lot of people. So this is the first night he doesn't get to eat the walls, you know, the cardboard or the materials that's um, got the lead in it. So he's, he's like going through withdrawal, almost like, um, like an addict going cold turkey. Jonah is my second son. When the weather was nice, he would run his cars back and forth in the window for hours, watching the cars drive by. And it made him the happiest little boy in the world. And that is where Jonah contracted lead from. When they tested my windowsill, it was full of lead. So every time those cars went in his mouth, as they normally do for an 18-month-old child, he was putting more lead into his body, and I had no idea. They told me that I was going to have to have him hospitalized. Um, they wanted to begin chelation immediately, and they sent um, people out from the county to check the house, which I was also running a home-based daycare from. I had to tell all my clients, your children are at risk. So I insisted that they have their children tested as part of my program requirement. From the time that he was 18 months old till he was four years old, um, he had blood level testing weekly and then monthly and then every three months. So he knew what was coming and it was horrifying for him. He started biting. He had never been a biter before. Sometimes he would kind of just sit there and stare off in space, which wasn't at all age appropriate for an 18 month old child. It took over his body. Again, you feel so guilty because I willingly, I got a good deal in the house. I wanted to move in, you know, right away, and I did. And my children paid the price for it. I had no idea something, something so, like, not talked about, something so, like, under the surface, like, lead, you know, just could change my life like that and my children's lives like that. This isn't something that's not common knowledge. You're not taught about this in, in any type of parenting class. You're not taught this in, in life or, you know, you've heard about it when you were a child or growing up and cases of lead poisoning, but you never think it's going to happen to you. I tried to protect my son. I really did. Like, I thought I was doing the right thing when I go to the doctor's office and they send, they give me a piece of paper and they're like, is your child exposed to lead or is your child eating non-food? I think I'm protecting him by saying no, 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 no. I think I'm protecting him by telling him he has no speech problems. He doesn't have any communication problems. He's okay. I thought I was protecting him, um, but I really wasn't. As with everything in being a parent, you have to advocate. Your child's not going to go up to the doctor or the school nurse or the teacher and say, you know, by the way, I think I may have lead poisoning. In the doctor's offices, you need to go in and say, I know that my child needs to be tested. His teachers are saying that this kind of thing is going on. I need you to check it out. Just don't sit back. If you go to your physician, your pediatrician, and you say, I think my house contains lead, it's an old house, could we please get a script to be tested for lead? If any pediatrician is not willing or downplays that, you need to find another pediatrician. You need to insist on it. So I've seen children that have suffered everything from bone damage to kidney damage. All of the children that I've represented suffer from cognitive impairments, um, have horrific uh, behavioral issues. A child who maybe is poisoned at age one or age two, they may not actually uh, have the cognitive issues until they've reached an age where testing becomes difficult, where they have to sit down and really concentrate on a subject for a long period of time. Once they get it down to a lower lead level, parents sort of think they're out of the woods. And uh, what they don't realize is that the problems will uh, manifest as the child becomes a little bit older and the schoolwork becomes more difficult. A lot of times it's very confusing to families to understand how, you know, a child just playing in the ground is going to get sick. 
because that's what kids do. You know, they play outside. So not knowing how it occurs, where it comes from, how children can get exposed to it, it's very foreign. And even though it's been around for many, many years, people still don't attribute it and understand it and say it's not happening here at our home. A mother that is exposed to um, lead during a pregnancy will have um, the ability to pass some of that exposure to her child, her unborn child. And th that can affect their development. Uh, and it can be devastating in many ways. Lead poisoning for a child makes a big difference in the outcome for their life. So a newborn child has a potential. And that potential uh, is really unlimited in all the things that they might be able to do or accomplish. And as we watch our children grow, we think about their particular talents and what they might be able to do. And we see a life path for them. I've uh, looked at that myself with my own children. But we also have to consider what happens to the child who's been lead poisoned. That path takes an abrupt turn. That path never is fulfilled to the level that it could be fulfilled. And they will have a whole different outcome on their life than a child who is not lead poisoned. They are disruptive. They may sit and they may jiggle or they may go like this or twirl their hair. Um, they may tap, they may get up may go look out the window, they may talk out loud, they may t hit, hit punch. It's like bing, 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 all the time, short shooting, just quick, quick, quick. And it's taking you from here to here and not being able to just take that deep breath, relax, and get a grip on what's going on. There's been a lot of research done that indicates that as children who are lead poisoned get older, they have a slew of behavioral issues. They've lost a great amount of impulse control. They have very little ability to respect authority figures. They're not getting the education that they need. The research has shown that children that are lead poisoned are much more likely to become criminals. There has to be a strong correlation that these people are intoxicated with lead and making bad decisions, winding up in jail. If we could fix the lead issue, it will be less kids that grow up with having lead in their system, and I believe it will correlate to less people being incarcerated before making bad decisions. Sometimes those kids go back home, um, they're re-exposed to different things, and the cycle just continues and continues. And sometimes you see those kids as they get older and into the higher grades um, drop out of school. First of all, we have to have some sort of system for identifying kids. As a teacher, I actually have been given no formal uh, training or awareness preparation, anything related to lead poisoning. Really anything that I know about lead poisoning was just my own interest concerns and finding out. Self-esteem is one of the most important things that we can teach our children. And I see these children as being um, sad, not being able to form relationships and not being able to say what they want to say um, and put their thoughts into words. Their coping strategies um, have lessened or maybe they never even had any. It seems pretty apparent when you walk around schools that certainly a number of kids could be lead poisoned if you just look at symptoms or behavior, family history. A lot of people think that the only way a child can um, become poisoned by lead is by eating it. But just by existing and just by breathing what's in the air, if there's lead in the air, those children are breathing that into their little lungs and their new little lungs. and. Um, that just by itself can cause lead poisoning. Parents need to consider uh, what are the other possible ways a child might receive or become uh, exposed to lead. And, and there are many of them. That includes uh, children that are uh, from refugee families, so coming from a different country that they may have exposure in their homeland. There's certain types of uh, uh, cultural and ethnic herbs that sometimes are contaminated with lead. Think about this with um, any time home renovation is being done. That's a particularly important aspect of it. When Jonah was first diagnosed, they prepared me for the fact that he could be mentally handicapped for the rest of his life. There were um, tests on his future job ability, so we had to worry about whether or not he would be able to work if he got older if he was ever gonna be able to live on his own. Um, and sometimes I still question that. 
had no idea how hard it was for him. I thought I was just thinking about myself, like, oh, what am I going to do with my schedule, my work schedule, my two other children? I'm a single mom. What am I going to do? We have to be in the hospital five days. And it wasn't until then that I realized I have to make it all about him. I'm sorry you got lead poisoning. I'm sorry I made you sick. I'm sorry you went through the hell that you went through. And the hospital trips, and the needles, and the throwing up. I'm sorry that you suffered, and I'm sorry I couldn't protect you. I'm sorry. I know that there would have been anything that I could have done to, to this not ever happen to you. I would have done that a million times over. I would have taken it from you. I would have, I would have taken the lead so you would never have to go through it. You didn't do this. You didn't, if you didn't know, you didn't, you didn't do this. That's not your fault. They all feel responsible. They all feel as though this was something that they could have prevented and they didn't. And I think that's the thing that's, that's really resonated with me most as a mother. Most of the housing in cities is made before 1978. So you see a, a whole city full of houses to completely abate the lead, remove the lead, can be anywhere from 15, 25, up to $60,000. So a lot of times properties are sold for, for less than that. So it becomes something that landlords aren't eager to rush into um, and the tenants aren't aware of. So it kind of just, it's one of those problems that seems to fall through the cracks. Uh, being a landlord is definitely not easy. Um, that's a job on its own. It doesn't matter if you're a good landlord or a bad landlord. Once something goes wrong, it always kind of falls back on the landlord. And they make it seem like you weren't doing your job or doing your part. But I can't be within your household all the time and dictate what you should do or shouldn't do. That's everyone's going to live their own personal lives. It's very easy to paint the landlords as the bad guys in this operation. Um, but really, these are people who have worked to improve these homes. Sometimes they're, they're either unaware or uh, just themselves struggling to get by and, and economics becomes a real problem for them as well as the tenants. Being a landlord or a property manager, it's your tr you want to keep your place as safe as possible for the people within it and also for whoever comes there for whatever reason. It's just a responsible thing to do. I don't think it's not just a landlord responsibility, but I think it's just a social responsibility in general for the government and you know the upper power who have or could create certain programs and put more help and effort to stop an issue that is a cause to many other issues. Testing children detects lead poisoning after a child is poisoned. Testing properties prevents the exposure altogether. It is 100% preventable and we are not doing enough. Lead poisoning is real and it's your responsibility when you bought the building. I advise all of my clients when they're relocating to do a walkthrough before they sign any lease agreement. They have a right to receive a federally required lead paint disclosure from their landlord for any building built before 1978. If a landlord is aware of lead hazards in a property, they're required to disclose that to every single tenant. The lead prevention program in the county we're in has been utterly fantastic. They've been anything but threatening and they've been offered tremendous help and we really appreciate that. The way that some municipalities, some successful municipalities have tackled it is by focusing on remediation, um, encapsulation, uh, basically making sure that the floors and the surfaces are clean, replacing windows, replacing door frames, making sure that uh, a test is done every three years or so. The tools that have been drafted into legislation on multitude levels, whether it's federal, state, or local, are all we need to eradicate the lead poisoning of our children in this country if we had the resources to go through and see them followed as they were intended. There are only a few jurisdictions that I am aware of that have laws in place 
that require the screening of properties. Those locations, we are finding, have had a huge reduction in uh, lead levels in children. And that is because we're not waiting until a child's poisoned to find the problems. This is a predator in your home and you need to be aware of it and you need to look for it and that's how you're going to be able to keep your children safe. The EPA provides an eight-hour course called RRP, Renovate, Repair, and Paint. And it basically shows you lead-safe practices if you're going to fix up your homes. That's something we really need to focus on as, as elected officials, as, as the municipality, as the county, to make sure that people are educated about renovating houses and safe practices, especially um, you know keeping the surfaces wet if you're going to be doing stuff so that the dust doesn't get up into the air and, and uh, poison everyone in the vicinity. Even though we have these hazards in these older housing stock, it is very possible and affordable to put the interim controls in place, identify the hazards, properly, safely repair them, get fresh coats of paint onto those locations and do an interim control until our community and city can do something to address a more long-term solution to mitigate the effect of exposure to these risks. If caught early enough, it could actually be something that saves not just the individual, it saves everybody. It saves the medical industry, insurance industry. You're not spending all this money on treatment. You're not spending all this money on maybe a future adult with special needs. You know, how many adults could be out, out there right now? We could help them just from a finger prick, just from getting tested. Imagine if our children weren't so lead poisoned. Imagine if we didn't have these crime rates. Imagine if we didn't have these poverty issues. Making sure our community can reckon with our legitimate lead problem. We will have less failing students. The reality is, is that we will have less struggles in our school district. The reality that we are creating is that these kids will become more productive members of the community because as their brains are working with the IQ the universe blessed them with, we are making that talked about brighter future a reality. All it takes is determination and advocating for your child. That doesn't cost anything. Don't put it out in front of the class, because my teachers did that. Take them aside, talk to them, ask them if they're okay. And if they say no, then try to help them. Don't just brush it off. I don't want to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. That's all I really want.